ourselves tonight. Praise the Lord. If you're joining us online, service will begin in approximately five minutes.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, and we're looking forward to what the Lord has. Just a few quick announcements. Something I forgot to mention here uh, this morning. There's a new Pentecostal Life magazine out in the foyer. If you'd like to grab one of those, feel free to. If we run out on the table there by the rocking chair, there's more in the magazine rack. So um, if you enjoy that, please feel free to grab one here this evening. Uh, just a quick overview of the announcements that I made this morning. Um, this Thursday is kind of the eve before Christmas Eve. So that's going to be our official, we had our official Christmas service this morning. But then uh, on that, uh, the eve before Christmas Eve, the 23rd, uh, we are going to have service, but it will be an abbreviated service. We're going to sing a few Christmas songs, and I will get up and share just a few real quick words to keep it very short, I promise, probably no more than 10 minutes. And then I'm going to give each of you, because of the message this morning was all about uh, exceeding joy, right? I want us to all get up, you know, whoever would like to anyway, and I'm, you're not going to have to come up to the platform. I'm just going to have you stay in your seat. And we're just going to share a word of joy from each person who'd like to share uh, during that service. Okay? So it's going to be very, very brief. Hopefully uh, we'd go an hour or less. Okay? And uh, that way if you uh, are getting together with family or whatever, uh, you can do that. Um, all right. Then on next Sunday, <coughs> next Sunday will be only one service. That's the 26th, so it's the day after Christmas. We'll have our morning service only, and then in the evening you'll have that free in case you have family in town or whatever, you want to spend time with your family. That's great. Uh, so that'll be going on on uh, just one service next Sunday. Then come the 30th, the following Thursday, that will be our annual vision service, and I will share... The vision for 2022. You're not going to want to miss that. God gave me the vision message clear back in May. And uh, I have been anxiously awaiting the chance. I have been fighting the urge to share tidbits all year long. And uh, usually the Lord doesn't give me the vision message till October. And this year he sprung it on me early. And uh, it's been a real hard fight not to bring it out in various messages throughout the year. However, let's, uh, uh, that, that's coming up. So that's going to be on the 30th. And uh, I don't think I have anything else to share at this point. So let's go ahead and let's go to the Lord and invite him into this service tonight. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence. We invite you, Lord, to have your way in this tabernacle tonight. Lord, be high and lifted up. Let your train fill this temple as we worship and glorify your precious name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight. You said if you
see the king of your heart today. Hallelujah. Oh, he is worthy of honor and glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated here this evening. Hallelujah. Now, a few prayer requests that we want to make sure we bring to your attention here this evening. Let's remember to pray for the Cup family as they're still struggling in their health. Also, uh, Sister Karen has put in her request for a co-worker of hers, Mrs. Jenny, her mom, her dad, Christine, and Lauren, and her uncle Daniel all, are all in the hospital with COVID. Hallelujah. So let's remember uh, those people, uh, mom and dad and Christine, Lauren, and uncle Daniel. Uh, uh, this is Jenny. Hallelujah. You have an unspoken request you'd signify by raising your hand here tonight. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord right now. Ask him to touch each and every need in this house. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you once again for this opportunity to be in your presence. And Lord, we invite you, oh God, to touch each and every need in this place both spoken and unspoken. You know the situation, you know the heart, God, before we're even able to ask or think, whether it be a need of healing or deliverance or salvation, whatever it is, oh God, we know that you are more than able. You are willing to touch the very feeling of our infirmities. And, and Lord, we come to you believing, oh God, that you are who you say you are and you will be who you will be. And Lord, we thank you for it. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord as Sister Della sings. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hand.
Hallelujah. I will sing of the goodness of my God. Hallelujah. He is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the name of Jesus. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Brother Rusty, if you don't mind passing out the handouts here tonight, we do have some handouts for you to follow along if you would like to and take some notes. I'm hoping and praying here tonight that the message here will touch you and really bless your heart and your thought processes and your thinking here tonight. And, uh, oops, my notes. Let me pull it up real quick. Hallelujah. And let's get the recording started. Hallelujah. We are continuing our series on living the good life. And if I, if I were to title this message tonight, I would title it Spirit and Truth. Spirit and Truth. And if you'll turn with me to the book of John, chapter 10, <coughs> and verse number 10. I have one verse that I will read in your hearing, and then I will let you be seated. John 10 and verse 10 says this, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Amen. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this people. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them here this evening. God, that you would touch our hearts and our minds. Help us to hear and receive from your word. Help us, O oh God, to let it penetrate the very fiber of our being. Help me, O oh God, to speak with power, authority, love and compassion, with expediency, but with efficiency. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated here this evening. Now, for those of you online, give us an amen. amen. Um, I know when I, I, I moved to the uh, camera here in the congregation that it looks like there's nobody here except Sister Karen sitting way back there in the back. But that's because everybody else is sitting on the right side. And uh, <laughs> we are... A uh, very, yeah, not so Karen moves off to the right as well. We are a very um, <laughs> right centered, I don't know, actually, if you're facing my direction, y'all are lefties. Yeah. So I, I don't know. That, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> if it was going to come out of your mouth and mine, one way or the other, it was going to be safe. Hallelujah. <laughs> but uh, so, and we do have a few folks online with us here this evening. We appreciate those that are online. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to talk about spirit and truth. You know, um, we've been talking about the, the, the book of John, the gospel of John. And we focused in on John because John has a very unique gospel. He lived a, quite a while beyond all the other apostles. He had a half a century, if you will, of spirit-filled living beyond what the other gospel writers had. And he talks more about things regarding the Spirit and the Holy Ghost than any of the other writers do. And tonight I'm going to focus on a portion of John's gospel that is very important, that probably one of my favorite portions of Scripture, quite honestly. Now, John 
talks about how that Jesus had to go into Samaria. And he reveals that it, by, by saying that, that, John, that Jesus had to go into Samaria, that there was some kind of driving force, if you will, or, uh, or a divine appointment mm -hmm. that took place. And the reason this is important is because Samaria was not a part of the holy lands that a good Jew would go to. Just to give you a little background, it's in Samaria, the area that was known as Samaria at the time, where they have found Jewish synagogues that in the mosaics of the floors of Jewish synagogues were mosaics to false Roman gods in synagogues. So the Samaritans were not known for being the most upright, if you will, the most conservative, if you will, however you want to phrase it in today's standard. Uh, they weren't the, the, the quote-unquote conservative Christians, to use a more modern vernacular. Um, they were definitely more in the uh, liberal side of the spectrum because they were a mixed multitude. They were inbred with, or interbred with, I uh, shouldn't say inbred, they were interbred with Gentiles. They adopted Gentile customs. But yet, Jesus had to go through Samaria. And in chapter 4, verse 9, John makes it clear that the Jews really had no dealings with Samaritans. And I find it interesting to, for Jesus to have to go through Samaria. One of the things he does, he sends his, his disciples off grocery shopping. Sends them off to the local Dillons to go find some stuff. Meanwhile, Jesus goes to the probably the most immoral area of the nation of Israel to visit a woman who clearly was not the most morally upstanding individual of her community. Right. Yet Jesus still loved her. Right. To give you an idea of how Jews of the time might regard the Samaritans, there was a Jewish proverb that said, may I never set eyes on a Samaritan. Most Jewish men would not, or most Jewish men of that day would have started their day with a prayer, thanking God they were not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Okay, just to give you a little background, ladies, don't crucify me here. I'm not saying anything. I'm just telling you some facts. Jewish men did not talk to women that they were not related to or married to in public. Okay? But Jesus shows up on the scene that day and asks a woman he does not know for a drink of water. And so, of course, this lady is taken aback that clearly this Jew would talk to her. So she has to reply. And as she does, she makes it clear, hey, who are you to be talking to me? And uh, it's interesting because Jesus tells her that he is the living water. And in the Greek language, which the New Testament is written in, it reveals to us that Jesus uses two different verb tenses here. In John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh, the word drinketh there is ongoing, a sustained action. 
much like what we talked about this morning, okay? He that thirsteth after righteousness shall be filled, right? He that drink, whosoever drinketh, that single sustained action, okay? Or that, that sustained action, rather, of water shall never thirst again. But whosoever drinketh, and this verb, drinketh, is a single action. It, uh, it should have been whoever drinks, not drink up, but whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea here. He's using two different verb tenses. Whosoever drinketh, so you have to continually go back to the well. Think about it, right? You don't just drink one cup of water in the morning and you're good for the rest of your life. Right? You have to keep going back. But Jesus then turns around and says, but whosoever drinks of me, single action, I will give him water and he will never thirst again. Now that's interesting. Because we know, as we talked about this morning, the Bible says, whosoever hungereth and thirsteth after righteousness shall never be filled. It's that, that constant pursuit so Jesus is talking about something a little bit different here. It's this single action that's going to cause, and the reason they will never thirst again is not because once you've taken and tasted of the Holy Ghost, that's all there is, but the water I shall give of him, Jesus says, will be a well of water springing up and turn to eternal life. In other words, once you have drunk of this water, it will sustain you because it comes from the inside out. Okay? Clearly, whoever drinks of what this world offers, whether it's physical water or if it's some spiritual implication uh, of water that this world may offer, you will thirst again. You will not be satisfied. But whosoever takes of and drinks of the water that Jesus gives will never thirst again. Okay? Now, Jesus reveals these details to her of her life. Right? He says to her, bring me your husband. She says, well, I'm not married. And he says, well, you've rightly said. Because you've been married five times and the man you're living with is not your own. Right? So he, he all of a sudden opens up and, and reads her mail to her, right. right? And so all of a sudden she's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm in the presence of a prophet, right? Yeah. So now the, the conversation is going to take a turn, yeah, right. okay? We, now the conversation turns to the conflict that was going on Within, and I'm going to use the term, I realize it wasn't a church, but I'm going to use the term church. There's this conflict going on in the church of the day. Whether you worshipped in Samaria or you worshipped in Jerusalem. Now, it goes beyond one mountain or another mountain. Okay, It's dealing with the concept of what makes you, and I'm going to use instead of the term Jewish, what makes you a Christian. It's this this is it the right wing or is it the left wing is it the conservative or is it the liberal okay i have this weird tuk 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 going in on my head <laughs> hey me too dad it's just this uh, there's some microphone up here that is uh, oh i see what it is it's this one over here. There we go. There we go. That, that made that go away. I was starting to think I was in a Doctor Who episode there for a mem moment. Now, if you've, if you've never watched Doctor Who, I'm sorry. Uh, you're just going to have to go off and, and watch all the Doctor Who episodes to figure out what I'm talking about. All right. So, which religion is right? What kind of worship makes me right with God is the question she's asking. The Samaritans only accepted the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, okay? Those that were uh, canonically thought to be written by Moses, okay? 
And in doing so, they missed out on later revelations that God gave to his people. And they did not get to see all the truth that was available to them. The Jews, however, were just as bad because they had the entire revelation of God's word of, at the time. But their religion had become form and formality. They had truth, but there was no spirit in it. Okay, you, you follow me so far? They had truth, but no spirit. But the Samaritans had spirit and no truth. Okay? And you've got to have both. You see, Jesus then turns around and looks at her when she brings up this this controversy, if you will, that's going on in the church at the time, he totally bypasses this conversation, and he goes to the root of the matter. See, that's what Jesus is good about. Mm -hmm. yep. he, he, you, you try to deflect him with all kinds of weird arguments, and he goes right at the root of the matter, right to the heart of what the problem is. And he basically tells them, or tells her, that what God is looking for is spirit and truth. In other words, he says, God is looking for a balance between spirit and truth. And he says that God is seeking worshipers that understand that concept of a balance. John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word balance, church, means an equilibrium. To have an equivalency. To, to set things in such an order that it's balanced. Right now, this congregation is not balanced. Everybody's over here on this side. Except for Buddy and Grandma, who's right here. And Karen, who's way back there. And, uh, the whole thing is just, it's all way out of balance right now. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a balance. We're talking about an equilibrium. Keep things even on an even keel. Keep things in harmony. It implies an adjustment of your life as things and events happen. Okay? Proverbs 11 and 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Job 31 and 6, Let me be weighed in an even balance, that God may know mine integrity. And of course, Daniel 5 and 27, one of my favorite passages, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. In life, as it is in the church, it's always easier to lean to one side or the other, to go to an extreme to one side or the other. The most difficult position is one that's right in the middle of the road because you get attacked from both sides. Okay? Extremes are easy. But balance is difficult. It is easy to let your life get out of balance and go chasing. We call this witch hunts. Go chasing after witches. Stepping over dollars in search of another dime. That's what we're talking about here. You cannot allow yourself to get so out of balance you miss the bigger picture. It's all too easy to overemphasize certain biblical principles at the expense of other equally important principles. Jesus talked about this with the Pharisees when he said, Look, you're telling the people to tithe mint and rue, but you're forgetting the weightier things of the law. Right? They were chasing after these itty-bitty little things instead of focusing on the big picture. Just to give you some clarity of what I'm talking about. The same Bible that teaches us 
to be ready for his coming also teaches us to occupy till he comes. The early church had a problem with this, and Paul had to deal with it. That theologians tell us that at one point the early church believed so hard, so much that Jesus was about to come back, they would all gather on top of a mountain waiting for him. They wouldn't go to work. They wouldn't do anything. They just sat on a mountain waiting for Jesus to come. And Paul had to correct this and said, no, you need to occupy till he comes. Yes, he's coming back, but keep working, keep moving, keep going forward. The same Bible that teaches us that God looks at the heart tells us that man looks at the outside. The same Bible that says we are saved by faith is the same Bible that tells us that faith without works is dead. The same Bible that teaches us that God is a God of love is the same Bible that teaches us that God is a God of justice. The same Bible that teaches us that God loves us the way we are is the same Bible that teaches us that he doesn't want us to stay that way. When we get unbalanced, we tend to go too far to the left or to the right, and we need balance in our lives. Most importantly, we need balance in our worship. We need balance in our praise. You know, it's easy to sit there and say, boy, I sure wished the church would get with it and run and shout. But the church ain't going to run and shout if you don't run and shout. It's easy to, to be running and shouting and biting the ceiling and swinging from the chandelier and looking at the person sitting in the pew with their hands raised saying, I'm more spiritual than you are. It's easy to sit on the pew it, it, it just totally consumed in worship and look at the person who's up at the front dancing saying, I'm more spiritual than you are. We don't judge our spiritualness based on how many flips you can do across the front of the congregation. I did six flips and you only did four, so you're not as spiritual as I am. We need balance of spirit and truth. Why is this important? Number one, God's truth strengthens the stakes and God's spirit lengthens the cords. What am I talking about? Well, if you look at Isaiah 54 and 2, enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. So God's truth will strengthen the stakes. God's spirit will lengthen the cords. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the growth of the tent. We have to have evangelism. The church cannot grow without evangelism. In other words, we need to lengthen the cords, make the tent bigger, include more people. You following me? But you cannot lengthen the cords of the tent and make the tent bigger unless you make the nails of the tent stronger. Because when the wind blows, it's going to pick that thing up and it's going to throw it around like a kite. The bigger the tent is, the longer the ropes have to be. The longer the ropes are, the stronger the stakes that go into the ground have to be to keep that thing grounded. We cannot enlarge the body of Christ and give up on prayer. We cannot enlarge the church and give up on holiness. You cannot make the church bigger by giving up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Number two, God's truth is a defensive weapon. But God's spirit is an offensive weapon. You see, the truth protects me when the enemy comes in on an advance. Right. Psalms 91 and 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. It is this defensive weapon. Ephesians 6 and 14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So the, the truth is a defensive weapon that protects me as the enemy attacks. But his spirit is an offensive weapon as and allows me to go against the enemy. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Zechariah 4 and 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Yes, amen. And Isaiah 59 and 19. When the enemy shall come in like a flood... The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Notice, truth protects me when the enemy attacks, but the Spirit is my offensive weapon to go against the enemy. Number three, God's truth brings death to the old man, but God's Spirit gives life to the new man. God's truth brings death to the old man, but God's spirit gives life to the new man. It is a well-known fact that truth can kill. I'll give you a few examples here. That new couple has that new baby. It looks like a wrinkled prune. And folks, sometimes babies, even after cleaned up, don't look good. Let's just be honest. Some people are pretty and have pretty babies. Some people are <laughs> ugly and have ugly babies. Okay? Now, what happens when that person says, look at my baby, isn't she pretty? Truth can kill. No, that baby ugly. That baby look like you. That's gonna be that. That's gonna get Mama Bear all riled up. Okay, so truth can kill. <laughs> According to a women's magazine, there are some questions that wives should never ask their husbands when we're talking about truth can kill. Here's question number one. What are you thinking? I love this one. There's this meme going around that shows a couple back to back in bed and 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 it has a bubble over her head. I'll bet he's thinking of other women and then a bubble over his head and it's something, you know, and it's always something different, but it's usually something like, "Hmm, I wonder if I tied a kite to, you know, the back of the car and you know, just oddball stuff that men think about." Because, ladies, by the way, we don't always think about women. I know you think we're pigs, but a lot of times we're thinking of really stupid stuff. Yeah, it's okay? really stupid stuff. <laughs> so when the ladies say, what are you thinking? The proper answer to this question is, of course, I'm sorry I've been pensive, dear. I was just reflecting on what a warm, wonderful, caring, thoughtful, intelligent Beautiful woman you are, and what a lucky guy I am to have met you. <laughs> Obviously, this is nothing compared to what the gentleman is really thinking about at the time, which is most likely has something to do with football, basketball, hunting, fishing, or nothing at all.
It could even be, I wonder what I would do with the insurance money if she died. <laughs> Another one. Here's one the ladies love to ask all the time. Do you love me? The correct answer to this question, gentlemen, in case you're curious, is yes! <laughs> if you feel like you need to elaborate a little bit more, you can answer with yes, dear. <laughs> the uh, wrong answers, gentlemen, would be something like, I suppose so. <laughs> would it make you feel better if I said yes? And the one that really is great for today's society, that all depends on what you mean by love. <laughs> Here's one, gentlemen, that every one of you are going to get at some point in time. Do I look fat? The correct answer to this is an emphatic, no, of course not and then quickly run into hiding. <laughs> the wrong answer is, I wouldn't call you fat, but I wouldn't call you thin either. Oh, ouch. Or how about this one? Compared to what? <laughs> or a little extra weight on you looks good. <laughs> or I've seen fatter. That will get you in the doghouse real, real quick. quick. Uh -huh. Finally, how about this one? <laughs> what would you do if I died? <laughs> Basically, every answer to that question is wrong. Maybe you might get by with, sweetheart, in the event of your untimely demise, life would cease to have meaning. And I would hurl my sile under the tires of the first Domino's pizza delivery driver that came by. After eating pizza. <laughs> <laughs> One, <laughs> yeah, and I, I got to be honest with you. One time, Sister Karen said, if anything ever happened to me, and this was when our kids were younger, if anything ever happened to me, would you get remarried? And I, my honest answer, folks, was simply this no. Because there ain't a woman that could tolerate me. <laughs> Another funny here for you real quick before I get back to it. In a uh, small town, there was a minister who was given a uh, homemade apple pie by one of the elderly women in the congregation. He graciously, graciously took the pie home to his family. And that afternoon, they sat down to lunch, and, and they decided to feast on this pie for dessert. And they immediately bit into it, and they found out that this pie tasted horrible. And try as hard as they liked, they could not stomach to eat the pie, so they took and they dumped the pie into the garbage. The next Sunday rolls around, and this elderly woman came up to the pastor and said, Did you enjoy my pie? The minister immediately went into panic mode. And then God spoke into his heart, and he said, Sister, as God is my witness, I can truly say that no pie like yours lasts as long around our house. <laughs> <laughs> the truth can hurt. Amen. Truth can kill. <laughs> Romans 7 and 7. Let's get back into it. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. In other words, Paul is telling us that Without the scripture, without the truth, we won't know what sin is. It won't be revealed to us. The truth brings me to death. My old man must die. Right. 
when I realize my sin. And so then God gives us his spirit to bring us to new life. Romans 8 and 26. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So truth brings death, spirit brings life. But you have to have both. Right. All right. Number four. God's truth gives me salvation. But God's spirit gives me relationship. Amen. We can't overemphasize relationship and we can't overemphasize salvation. We can't overemphasize truth. We can't overemphasize spirit. We have to have both. As I read through some of these verses, I want you to ask yourself this question. What saves me? Okay? Ask you this question. James 1 and 21. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 1 Peter 3 and 21. Even baptism doth also now save us. Acts 2 and 40. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Titus 3 and 5. According to his mercy, he saved us. Matthew 10 and 22. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Proverbs 28 and 18. Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved. Luke 7 and 50. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Acts 16 and 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. Romans 10 and 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 8 and 24. For we are all saved by hope. You never hear anybody talking about that one, do you? Yeah. Saved by hope. Mark 16 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Romans 10 and 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So let me ask you the question again. What saves me? The answer is simple. They all do. I'm saved when I obey the word of God which is God's truth. 1 Timothy 2 and 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 10. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. If all you and I ever did was apply God's grace and mercy or love alone to our life, saying that saved us, then the entire world would be saved. Because God has grace and mercy and love for everybody in the world. Okay? As I like to say, the devils believe and tremble. Okay? So therefore, if the devils believe, then they're saved too. But I have to obey God's word and to apply that salvation to my life. Okay? Truth saves me. But there are a lot of insecure saved people out there in the world today. Maybe you're one of them. However, despite the fact that truth saves us, it's God's spirit that works in the truth that gives me the relationship I need. It's God's spirit working in us. So we have to have the truth, which saves us, and the spirit, which gives us the relationship. Romans 8 and 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Number five. God's truth gives me freedom. 
God's truth gives me freedom. But God's spirit gives me liberty. Now, this is a little tougher one, but let, yeah. let's, let's work on this a bit. John 8 and 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall, what? Make you free. So truth gives me freedom. Some people see God's truth as too restrictive and too confining. If The question often is, if Jesus came to set us free, then why does God's word have so many rules? Okay? Well, let's, let's, let's take this at a little different angle. Okay? Your body has approximately 206 bones in it. Those bones are like the rules. They're like the, the doctrines. They're like the, the commandments of the Word of God. They're rigid and they're inflexible. Okay. But God did not give you bones to restrict your movement. Quite the opposite. You see, He gave you the skeleton, your bones so that your tendons and your muscles have something to attach to that gives you the maximum mobility that you can have. If you didn't have muscles and tendons, the soft tissue, you couldn't move. You'd just be a skeleton standing there, right? But without the skeleton, you're just a puddle of mush laying on the floor. You are. Okay? You just become a, 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 a blob because you can't move without the skeleton to give it the rigidity. So you need the truth of God's word, which gives you the freedom, but it's the spirit of God that gives you the liberty. A little bit of silliness here real quick. What do you call a man with no arms and legs in a swimming pool? Bob. What do you call a man with no arms and legs that goes water skiing? Skip. What do you call a man with no arms or legs that fell in a ditch? Phil. Get it, Phil? <laughs> Without, without the rigidity, without the bones, you're nothing. You're just that blob. But without the, the muscles and the tendons, the bones don't move. Right? So you've got to have both. Again, the balance here, folks. Right. Freedom means the absence of restraint, liberation from slavery. That's what God's truth does for us. It liberates us from slavery. But liberty goes beyond freedom because liberty gives us the power to choose to lack inhibition. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Now that the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Quite literally, God's truth frees us from sin. But it's God's spirit that allows me to enjoy that freedom without becoming a bondage to sin again. Stand with me this evening. In John's third snapshot, if you will, of the spirit-filled man, he knows how to balance worship. The spirit-filled man knows how to balance his worship. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. See, here's the key, church. If all you have is religion, religion is no better than sin. You want to know why? Because they both kill. They both kill. But when you find yourself in balance and you have the religion, you've got the truth, but now you add to it the spirit, 
Spirit that brings life. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this people. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would help us to learn the importance of balance in all we do, in our lives, in our worship, in our mannerisms. God, that we would understand the importance of your word and the truth in our lives. Father, I thank you for who you are, for who you desire to be. And I pray, Lord, tonight, lead and guide us into more truth. Lead and guide us into who you desire us to be in this end time. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight.